our mission for this month is to the nation of India. We do support several groups over there, uh, the Bharat Bible College with um, Dr. Samuel Baraga, um, who has been here several times. And uh, they are the group that goes out every December. Uh, they do a blitz in the surrounding uh, towns and villages where the school is located in Hyderabad, which is central India. And again, in India, because of its uh, very concentrated population, they, they reach hundreds and hundreds of thousands of yes. people uh, by not going very far at all. And so we're grateful uh, for him. Also, Pastor Biswas, who is up in the Himalayans, where it's much colder in northern India. And he, of course, has a children's home, uh, as well as his uh, gospel ministry as well, and the churches that he oversees. And we also uh, help Bishop Pathet uh, down in Kerala, which is in southern India, where it is quite warm. And uh, they have a children's home as well, as, as well as always, they, they always have uh, more than one congregation to oversee. It always reminds me of uh, how Ricker in Guatemala, uh, he works two churches every Sunday. And um, there's many people that need to be reached for the Lord. And so uh, they are our outreaches for the month of November uh, into India. I also want to mention Many of you, most of you, I assume, are familiar with Barbara Rowe. She is our missionary to El Salvador. I got a letter from her a few weeks back. She has been promoted, if you will, not the final promotion, that's the one to heaven, but um, in between, she is uh, being asked to come back to headquarters in Omaha, Nebraska, where she will oversee... Um, 15 countries, missions into 15 countries in Latin America, Africa, Asia, Europe, and North America, as well as still spending time back in El Salvador, that she's not going to forget the mission uh, at which she worked for so many years, uh, but she will be overseeing and training missionaries and going into the field and all of these other places. So uh, the Lord has used Barbara uh, and Barbara's faithfulness, and so we uh, will pray that we can continue to support her in this new, uh, new endeavor, this new leading of the Lord, uh, if you will. Uh, the other thing I uh, want to mention, uh, because it really is a mission, and that is what we have done over the years for the Baltimore Rescue Mission uh, downtown on Central Avenue. Uh, Chuck Bittner and his wife have run that uh, for a long time. And we sometimes do a special outreach during the Christmas season, uh, which is, I guess, officially upon us now that it's November. And uh, if you noticed on your way up the steps, there were two bins uh, right there by the, by the stairway next to where the hand sanitizer is on the table. Uh, one bin has a collection for men and the other for uh, women. The women are in the Karis House. The men are in the Baltimore Rescue Mission. And we would like you, uh, if you could, if you would, uh, to help us in supporting that. There are little flyers. That you can fit them in your pocket uh, on that table where the sanitizer is that lists what it is they need. And so take that with you. They need new clothing, but not any clothing. They're very specific because they have a lot of things already collected. Uh, and they're not looking for used. They're looking for new clothing for the men. Uh, colored short sleeve t-shirts, size medium to five extra large, and men's boxer briefs, medium to five extra large. And then for the women, uh, large uh, PJs, <clears throat> excuse me, size large to uh, seven extra large, and washcloths, uh, feminine or neutral colors for that, and then bed pillows, uh, something that you would sleep with, not necessarily something you'd uh, sit on the couch with. So um, that's what they are asking us to collect. So again, if you feel led 
uh, to give. We've given to the Baltimore Rescue Mission uh, a lot over the years, as well as the Helping Up Mission. And so we're, we're thankful for that. Um, and then one more missions outreach note uh, for the nation of Kenya. And we've, we've had missionaries there for years, uh, Gary and Pat Johnson, and um, uh, we've, we've had missionaries, and they're in the bush, out in, out, in the, in, out in the wild. And Judith Collins, who is over near Nairobi, and she's been there many years as well. Uh, but in addition to that, we have come to know and love and work with uh, six different pastors and their congregations uh, in Kenya. Uh, they are part of our International Council of Christian Churches, and um, they have really been hit hard. Uh, not just with the virus, uh, but with uh, the locusts, and with a famine, and with a drought, and they are dying. Uh, people in their churches, uh, again, whom we know, are, are dying uh, because of all this, so they, they have a tremendous need. So we are just, again, over, just over the next several weeks, I've set a smaller basket on the table uh, in the back there, the long table, uh, again, if you feel led, just to put something in there. And uh, we're, we're reaching out all around the world through our ICCC contacts, uh, so we do expect uh, people to be giving. Uh, but, the, but the need is dire. I mean, they're, they're dying daily over there. And uh, if we can help, that would be a blessing. So uh, having said that, let me, uh, let me move on to our prayer before the Lord. Father in heaven, we do thank you that we have this avenue of prayer, Lord, that we uh, are understanding uh, more and more every day the Apostle Paul's admonition to pray without ceasing. Yes. Lord, we need to be in prayer constantly, whether in groups, whether by ourselves. Uh, dear Lord, we always need to be speaking with and to you. We need to not only bring our petitions of, of need, but, but also, Lord, our our thanksgivings yes. and our praises for all that you have done and all that we pray you will continue to do. We thank you for your graces and your mercies, uh, which we're told are new each morning. And we are so thankful for that because we need them. Uh, it is so much needed, Lord. We do pray that you would be merciful to our nation. Yes. Uh, withhold your judgment, please, Lord. And we just pray again that the church uh, which is the, the moral compass of our nation. We pray that yes. the church would wake up. Yes. Uh, many have, but, but many more have not. And we need them to preach the word, mm -hmm. uh, preach the gospel, right. and preach the truth. Uh, Lord, we are in very difficult times. And we know we're not, we're not looking to change anything. We know your plan is in place. It's in motion, uh, dear Lord. Your prophecies will come true. But there are many yet who need to be saved. And we pray that you would continue to give us the freedom in America, the religious liberty yes. uh, to preach the gospel, uh, to continue to open our church doors, read our Bibles. Uh, much of that may be on the line in this election. And so, Lord, we pray again that you would continue to, uh, to be merciful to us. Yes. Father, we do pray for our leaders that you would give them godly wisdom. Yes and discernment, dear Lord, use them. Uh, as King Solomon said in, in Proverbs 21, uh, turning their hearts in whatever, whatever way you so please, because it is your will uh, which will be done, Lord. And that's, that should be our prayer, not my will, but thy will yes. in all things. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. We're thankful for the prayer rally that we had yesterday uh, publicly in in the courtyard uh, in front of the courthouse in Towson. And we thank you for those who came, dear Lord, and Amen. for those who prayed. And again, Father, we, we pray that uh, on their way home, they remember that uh, this is something they can do on their own each and every day. We, we don't need to gather corporately, but we're, we're blessed when we can. Again, Lord, not knowing when, when those days may end, we're uh, many countries around the world, uh, Christians have been driven underground. And so, Father, we pray that we can still make our public uh, confessions and professions of faith. Yes. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings you've uh, given our great land. Uh, we pray, Lord, for 
the missionaries, the ones we've spoken about, and the thousands uh, that we haven't, Lord, many thousands that we're not even aware of, but we know they're on the front lines. And Lord, we're grateful in whatever way, through our giving, certainly through our prayers, uh, to lift these people up, uh, give them boldness, uh, dear Lord, to, to preach the gospel and keep your hedge about them. Uh, many will give their lives today simply because they're Christian. And Lord, we thank you that you've given them the assurance of an eternity with you when they leave this earth. Amen. Again, Lord, we don't know when, uh, when the persecution may be increased here in our own land, uh, but when it does come, as it most certainly will, we pray that you give us strength yes. and that you give us boldness. Yes. Lord, we think about the, uh, the reformers today on this Reformation Sunday. They were bold Amen. while they were burning at the stake. They were Amen. quoting scripture and singing hymns. Yes. And your word continued to go out until the flames engulfed them. And so, Lord, we are, um, we're, we're blessed for the stand that they took. We're blessed uh, for the stand that all true believers have taken down through the years. Yes. And again, we pray, Lord, that you would give us the courage and give us the strength and give us the peace of mind, knowing that you are with us every step of the way, never to leave us nor forsake us. Thank we thank you, Father. Bless all who are here today. Uh, again, we, we all come with uh, something on our plate that we need to lift up to you, Lord, and you know what all of that is. And we just uh, pray, Lord, that you would hear our prayer and that you would lead us, Lord, and guide us in the ways that you would have us go. Yes. For those in our bulletin who are still sick or recovering or fighting this or fighting that, Lord, we pray for them, yes. and we ask your mercy, Please. as always, on each and every one of us. Again, thank you for the service today, Lord. Thank you for all who are here, and we're heading into the um, really the busiest season of the year is what I'm told, and, and we've got a lot planned. And Lord, we thank you for the, uh, the blessings that you bestow on us uh, in, in all of our endeavors. We thank you for the congregation meeting in our fellowship hall right now as well, Lord. Continue to, uh, to bless them. So grateful that we could literally today bring them in out of the rain, dear Lord, and, and uh, thankful for a, a dry and a warm and a well-lit uh, building in which they can worship. And Lord, we're grateful to bring the Lord's people uh, into worship wherever we can. So thank you, Father, again, for all that you do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I have to keep looking for all my notes here. Thank you for your patience in, uh, in bearing with us today. There's, there is a lot going on. Welcome, first of all, to all who are here. Welcome to those who are watching us on social media. Uh, we always appreciate uh, the effort everybody makes uh, to join us one way or the other. I did mention the prayer rally. Thank you uh, to any of you. I see a few of you here today who were there yesterday. Thank you for coming. Uh, we uh, must have made an impression on somebody because the police showed up about halfway through. And um, I think someone said that I, I happened to be on the steps in front of the courthouse, but apparently uh, employees were entering the building behind me and uh, maybe they felt unsafe. You never know what people praying might do. Um, so the police were there, but that's fine. Um, I needed to get a better idea on how to plan these future events anyway. I was told, skip the politicians, just come to the precinct. <laughs> and get permission. I said, that's good, because uh, we never did get permission from the politicians to do that. So uh, we're thankful the, the police were there um, to defend us as much as anything uh, in case there had been trouble. So again, thank you one and all who were able to join us. And um, we may need to do this again sooner rather than later. We'll keep you informed uh, about that. Speaking of prayer, uh, our prayer team is meeting, well, they met this morning in the conference room at 1030. They're meeting this week at 7, a half an hour prior to the ladies' Bible study on Thursday evening down in the fellowship hall. Uh, so please avail yourself of that. 
Uh, men can attend a prayer meeting. You can't stay for the ladies' Bible study, obviously. We have our own. On um, Saturday morning, our men's prayer breakfast, and we are going back uh, out into the public this month. We'll be at Bob Evans on Joppa Road, where we've been meeting for a long time at, uh, at 7.30 Saturday morning. So uh, please plan on joining us there if you can. Uh, you see also in here the Ladies' Christmas Choir, and uh, uh, my thanks to Mello for heading that up and, uh, and putting that together. It's, it's just for Christmas, right? I'm, I'm making sure I, I understand it. Although, if you're that good, we're going to ask you to come back, so just, just keep that in mind. Uh, we do want you to be that good. So um, they'll be meeting after church in the fellowship hall. Uh, to practice and get instruction and directions um, going forward here. No Bible study this Tuesday. Uh, there's, I guess, is there anybody other than me who hasn't voted yet? But um, I'll be voting Tuesday. I don't know what the lines will be like, Mrs. Decker. Uh, they will not be voting here. I've had to turn several people away because this is a polling place, but not this year. They finally put a sign out by the driveway saying, don't come here to vote. Um, not sure what went into all of that, but the um, Lord's Supper, very important item, will be observed next Sunday right here during our worship service. We will uh, serve communion. All who are trusting in Christ alone as their Lord and Savior, please join us in partaking of the elements. Uh, I think that is almost it. I talked about the uh, outreach downtown to the rescue mission. I spoke of Kenya. Uh, regarding the activity downstairs, and please, if you haven't gotten a look at the floor on your way out, uh, go check out our new floor. It's, it's really nice. Uh, and thank you all who uh, contributed towards that. Um, we appreciate that. Um, but we are in the process of getting all the doors keyed um, so that the church downstairs can come in and out of the middle door on the parking lot without propping it open. Um, and then the last door on the parking lot, we'd ask you to use that door if you need the elevator or if you're going to come up the back stairway. That keeps you out of the fellowship hall. If you come in the double doors in the back, you're right in the middle of their congregation. So come in the, the last side door. Um, today it's been propped open with a little wood shock, um, but we'll probably have a lock on that by next week. And uh, just keep that in mind, and, and we appreciate uh, your thoughts and your help on that. I think I'm done, Joe. So if you want to jump in there, thank yes, you. At this time, our children's church is dismissed. Uh, Head toward the back. The instructors will meet you there. And again, thank you for coming and fellowshipping with us. May the Lord give you a blessing this day, as certainly we are blessed by you coming and joining us. Brother Mike has made his way up here, so he's going to read scripture. I'm going to ask you all to please stand, grab your Bible. Let's look to the book of Ephesians. Mike's going to read six verses beginning in chapter 2, verse 4. That's Ephesians 2, 4. Brother Mike. But God, who is rich in his mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together in Christ. By grace ye are saved. Yes. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. For by grace are ye saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Yes, you may be seated. Thank you, Mike. Pastor will come with his message, a biblical reformation.
we were out at my daughter's house last night. They do a bonfire thing on Halloween and sitting around the bonfire and watching the flames jump up and feeling the, the intense heat. Uh, because if any of you know me, I, I get cold when the temperature goes below 80. So I try to get as close to things like that as I can. But um, just watching the flames shooting up in the air, and it was October 31st, it, it made me think about uh, Ridley and Lattimore, two reformers. Uh, many were burned at the stake, but, but those two are often uh, singled out because as they were tied to the stake, they started singing hymns and quoting scripture as the flames came up around them. And uh, it's a sobering thought. Um, Christians are being killed around the world every day. And, um, you know, evil, evil people who practice evil ways uh, will find more and more ways of putting those they don't agree with to death. And so just understand that uh, God's grace was sufficient even for Ridley and Latimer as they could sing and read, read scripture or quote scripture. It's always good to memorize scripture um, even while they, were in, while they were dying in the midst of the fire. So God will give you grace, grace sufficient. But today is what we... Protestants or Protestant is really the word. It's the day we like to call Reformation Sunday. We try to make it as close to October 31st as we can. It's a day that we set aside each year to celebrate and to remember what Martin Luther did on October 31st of 1517. And of course, that was a day that he famously nailed his 95 theses or objections to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany, the Castle Church. And those 95 statements were challenged by Luther. Now keep in mind, Luther was a Catholic. He was, a, he was an Augustinian monk. And he was reading his Bible and he saw things that, quite frankly, the church was not teaching very important things, and he wanted to bring that to their attention, and of course, this was uh, the shot heard around the world, I guess you could call it, uh, when he did this, um, but he disagreed with their teaching, the church's teaching of penance and the usefulness of indulgences, which we'll talk about in a moment, as well as the unquestioned authority of the Pope. Now, Luther was helped in his, uh, in his outcry. There was a recent invention. Actually, it was, uh, it was probably 30, 40 years before uh, he did this. And that invention, of course, was the printing press. Imagine having to write a lot of things by hand over and over again. Um, but Luther's protests were quickly translated into the German language, and printed copies spread like wildfire throughout Europe, quickly, in a manner of months. And that was quick in those days, believe me. Just like a fire would, it changed the landscape of the world forever. Luther's problem, again, was with the authority of the church over the life of the believer. You see, as, as a believer, you have a lot of authority on your own. Uh, you don't need us. You don't need Cub Hill. You don't need uh, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, you don't need anything standing between you and God. That, that, all those barriers have been broken down. And so Luther was questioning these things. He questioned Rome's practices and abuses which enslaved the people enslaved them with fear and superstition, teaching them that it was the church rather than Jesus Christ that opened the gates to heaven. The church at that time, uh, again, just coming out of the dark ages, had total authority over all the people. So spiritually speaking, they were held in bondage. 
They didn't have a Bible to read. They went to church and the Bible was chained, the only Bible was chained to the pulpit. And it was written in a different language and nobody understood, Latin. There were no copies of the Bible in the pews. And again, it wouldn't have mattered much because most of those people were illiterate anyway. They couldn't read. They had no choice but to believe every word that came out of the mouth of the priest. Not unlike, if you want to bring it forward 500 years, not totally unlike the fake news of today, which is designed to purposely keep people in the dark. If the news outlets, and of course back then, and, and even a few hundred years past that, the town square, the church pulpit was where a lot of people came to get their news. In colonial America, it was that way as well. Well, if the people who know the news are not speaking it, are not getting it out there, nobody's the wiser. And so again, we see a lot of that going on right now. Um, in, in a, not in a religious sense, but uh, in the political world. And so with this unquestioned authority, the church really had free reign. They could do pretty much whatever they wanted to do. A case in point was the question which Luther asked in thesis number 86. He wanted to know, why does the Pope, whose wealth is greater than the richest Roman, build the Basilica of St. Peter with the money of poor believers rather than using his own money or the church's money. This was Luther's way of expressing his disagreement with Johann Tetzel's selling of indulgences at that time. Now, Tetzel was a priest. He had been commissioned by Pope Leo X to collect payment, to collect money for dead souls. In order to raise funds to finance the building of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, the church authorized Tetzel to go from town to town, from village to village, and tell the people that by paying an indulgence or giving money, is what that was, by doing that they could free their loved ones from a place called purgatory which if you examine your Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you'll find no mention of that place. Once again, the people just knew what they were told, and they were told that when you die, you go to a place called purgatory. But if you give money for your dead relatives and friends who are in purgatory, you can free their souls, and they'll be on their way to heaven. In fact, Tetzel had a little rhyme that said, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. So again, Luther's challenge to the church uh, was a call to return to scripture for salvation because it's all in this book. You don't need help from anywhere else. Scripture, sola scriptura in the Latin. Scripture alone. What does 2 Timothy 2 Timothy 3.15 say, The Holy Scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells you how to get to heaven. You don't need anything else, really. We're here, yes, to maybe uh, learn some things or to uh, expand our knowledge of Scripture, but we come together to worship. We come together in, in a fellowship to, to praise the Lord and to worship him as we are exhorted to do in the book of Hebrews. That's why we um, had such a, such a fit back in the spring when they closed the doors. We want to come where the scriptures encourage us to come, to church, to worship the Lord. Church tradition, papal pronouncement, won't get you to heaven. 
Now, there were four other solas, five altogether, sola scripture, of course. The other four were sola gratia, by grace alone, sola fide, by faith alone, solus Christus, through Christ alone, and soli deo gloria, to the glory of God alone. So these five solas articulated five fundamental beliefs of the Protestant Reformation. Pillars, if you will, which the Reformers believed were essential to the Christian life and Christian practice. The Westminster Confession of Faith, which is what we've been studying in Sunday school, was written uh, a few decades after Luther put his theses on the church door. But the confession was written to show the Bible's authority over the church. And we look at about 33 different subjects uh, through the confession. Uh, basically a, a systematic theology, if you will, of what the Bible teaches. Unfortunately, when churches, or in the case of Protestantism, denominations become steeped in traditions and pageantry, it often gets twisted the other way around and the traditions get raised up above the scripture. The Bible gives us freedom and this knowledge was unleashed to believers everywhere through the work of Martin Luther and again many others. There were many, many who came uh, after Martin Luther to uh, keep this, this movement this movement moving to keep it alive. The need for the Reformation was there. And I might say the need for the Reformation is still there. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes as well. Through it, the entire course of history was changed. John Calvin came along and he opposed the hereditary monarchy. You know, we don't have a hereditary monarchy here in the United States. Um, most countries, especially during the founding of our country, um, ruled that way through a totalitarian uh, monarchy. And uh, Calvin opposed that as well as the aristocratic bondage that went along with it. If you weren't part of the royal family, you were out in the streets out in the fields, wasn't much hope for you. You didn't have much of a future. It's been said that the two great pillars upon which the kingdom of Satan is erected and upheld are ignorance and error. And we have to keep those in mind, uh, knowing that the scriptures overcome those things. Again, getting back to, to the way governments are set up, uh, Calvin pointed out that uh, scripture was very clear in speaking of human liberty, equality, and self-government. Again, none of which was being practiced around the world during that time. The, the rise of democracy in modern history stands side by side with the deliverance of God's people out of bondage. And the bondage, again, was the church's hierarchy. A lot of countries were run by a coalition, if you will, of government and church. In some cases, they were one and the same. So it was difficult to get out from under that shadow. But getting back to the ignorance and error that really uh, rules all of those who, who don't know, obviously, uh, Jesus said in Acts 26, 18, that he was sending Paul to the Gentiles to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto the power of God. Know the truth. We quote that all the time. Know the truth, Jesus said in John 8, 32, and the truth shall make you free. In Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16, again, a passage that you're all very familiar with. He said, all scripture is given 
by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for the instruction in righteousness. If there was ever a verse that defined the Reformation, that's it. Go to the scriptures alone because the scriptures are God's inerrant, infallible word. That's why it's profitable for doctrine and instruction in righteousness and correcting and rebuking that which is wrong. If you think something is wrong that's being said, um, theologically speaking, uh, but again, it even drifts into the uh, area of civil matters, and you know the Bible speaks against that, point the people to the Bible. This is the gold standard. This is what we are given by the Lord himself. If you find fault with something, correct it. And the reformers in the early and middle 1500s found a lot that was wrong with the Catholic Church. That's why they, they wrote the Confession of Faith. They wrote it to correct false doctrine. And to correct it, the only way they knew how was Scripture. God was clearly at work in the hearts of his people. While Luther brought many of Rome's indiscretions to light, again, it was Gutenberg who may have had the more forceful impact with the invention of his printing press uh, in 1440, so actually that was more like 75 years before Luther, but it facilitated Luther's work in reaching the masses. No pun intended there. Uh, many believers who were held in abeyance to papal edicts caught the spark, the spark that fanned the flames of the movement to reform the church, to correct that which was wrong, giving obeisance to God, not to the Pope or not to any human being. It was an exciting time to be a true believer. They've come out of darkness. They're seeing things and hearing things that they never knew before, and it was setting them free. Many were affected and encouraged by these truths which the reformers had revealed, along with the subsequent freedoms that came with them. They were already in the scriptures, but again, they had been suppressed for hundreds of years. So they weren't, they weren't learning anything new, really. They were just learning things that were new to them. I imagine it evoked feelings similar to what the colonists felt in our own country's fight for independence. Men gathered together with bodies of believers throughout Europe, writing up their own confessions of doctrine to follow. They were excited about their newfound liberty, and well, they should be. They sought to worship the God of the Bible according to the Bible, again, not according to tradition or man's dictates. The Reformation brought believers together in true ecumenism, that of scriptural unity. Were there disagreements on any of these matters? Of course there were. Look at how many denominations there are in the Protestant church today. Of course there were disagreements. But they were all in agreement that the Bible and not the Pope was, the God, was God's spokesman. They came to Westminster in England from all over. And yes, they represented many factions. Some of the names uh, that you may be familiar with, some maybe not so much. John Knox, Andrew Melville, Thomas Coleman, John Lightfoot, Samuel Rutherford, and Thomas Goodwin. All were committed to preserving the proper biblical way of worshiping God. And they followed in the footsteps of Luther and Melanchthon, Calvin and Zwingli, Huss and Wycliffe. God's word has always and still today burned brightly in the hearts of those who are seeking his truth. And you know what? Our merciful God honors that faithfulness. 
2 Chronicles 16, 9. I quoted this yesterday at the rally. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of those whose heart is perfect or complete toward him. So God is seeking men and women who are seeking him. Search his word. That's how you seek him and that's how you find him. Search his word and seek his will for your life. And once you do that, then just tell him you're available. Lord, here I am. Use me. Don't stand in the way of the blessings that God has prepared for you. He has prepared blessings for each of us. He's put each of us on a path, a journey. Yes, there are, uh, there are challenges along the way, trials, potholes in the road, if you will. But there are so many blessings. So many blessings. The real blessings, of course, are when you share his love with others. And God's word to us could not be any clearer than it is in the text that Mike read for us. Look at uh, verses 4 through 7 in Ephesians 2. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. God loved us. And he loved us when we didn't love him. Again, we were dead in our sins. We could care less about God. He still loved us. We couldn't love him because of being spiritually dead. Dead people can't show love. Dead people don't show any emotion. And we were dead because we were God's enemy. And we were his enemy because we were still in our sins. And a sinful people cannot exist in the presence of a holy God. That's why there's no sin in heaven. Sin cannot exist in God's presence. So do you understand the shape we were in? We were in no shape. Certainly not in any condition to help our own cause. But instead of leaving us dead, spiritually dead, which is where we belonged because of our sin, God had mercy on us, we read in verse 4. To receive mercy, what does that mean? It means not to get what you deserve. America deserves to go up in fire and brimstone tomorrow because of our national sins. But we pray for God's mercy so that we don't get what we deserve. It's coming one day to the whole world. Read Bible prophecy. But we pray that while God is merciful, we have time to reach one more soul with the gospel message. One more to be told that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Only Jesus can forgive your sins. We're all sinners. If you're still wondering about that, understand what he did on the cross and accept it. Trust in it. And you too can have eternal life. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23 says. So that's what we all deserve. But God's love was so great that he quickened or, or brought back to life spiritually. He did so with Christ. We've been redeemed in Jesus Christ for only one reason. And it's because Jesus was raised from the dead. He died for our sins. But if Jesus had never risen again, neither would we. We'd be forgiven, but we'd still be dead in the grave. Without his resurrection, we are dead in our sins. It's by grace that we're saved. And again, grace is the opposite. 
so to speak, of mercy. Grace is getting that which you don't deserve. Another day without fire and brimstone means another day of grace. And by that, he has raised us up to sit in heavenly places. Again, all by what Jesus did, not by dropping a coin into a can. It's not of works, verse 9 says. You can't buy your way into heaven. And you can't buy anyone else's way there either. And to suggest that you can does not come out of the Bible. That was a lie. That was a lie, a satanic lie. And it came by way of the Church of Rome. I sincerely hope that Pope Leo repented of that lie. Which if he didn't start it, and there's no clear indication that he did start it, he certainly perpetuated it. And did you know to this day, the Catholic Church is still charging people to get into heaven. They send out mass cards when people die, which if you're purchasing a mass card in remembrance of someone, you're paying money for it, money which goes to the church. And then, of course, they say that they will say a mass for you or for the dead person so that they might be sent on their way into heaven. If you're going to pray for somebody's soul, you better do it while they're still above ground. Once they are gone, it is too late. Don't pray for the dead. There's nothing you can do for them. Pray for their families that are left behind. But you, you can't affect them one way or another spiritually once they're dead. Pray for them now. God sent Martin Luther to speak out against this heresy, and he calls us to do no less. So are we starting to get an idea how precious God is here? He's rich in mercy and grace because we cannot do it on our own. He makes that abundantly clear in verses 8 and 9 of the text again that Mike read for us. Salvation is God's gift to us. It's not the church's gift to us. And we can't give God anything in return for what he's bestowed upon us. It's a gift. And to think you can charge someone for what God freely offers is an insult. God said it was a gift because if we thought that we had anything to do with it, verse 9 tells us, we'd tell the world about it wouldn't we? We'd boast. We, we'd be going up and down the gold streets of heaven telling everybody what we did to get there. It's not about that. It's not about us. That's about pride. Pride brought down Lucifer and it brought down Adam and Eve. And it will bring down the Antichrist one day. And it will bring down any church, Catholic, Protestant, whatever, who preaches outside of what these scriptures say. To believe in any other gospel of salvation other than what's been given us in Jesus Christ is heresy. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but by him. No one. To pursue any other path, to go, to choose any other way that you think will get you to the Father in heaven leads to hell. Scripture is very clear on what the doctrines of God are. The issues that prompted the, Refor the Reformation are 500 years old. But they haven't gone away. The time has come again for the exposition of sound doctrine. Paul was very specific about this when he told the Galatians in uh, chapter 1, verse 8, Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Put a curse on him. When a church teaches that something other than Christ alone saves the soul, 
it preaches another gospel and it incurs the condemnation of the scriptures. And that's of what we need to be cautious. There's a lot of deception. We, we talk about this ad nauseum, but it needs to be talked about. There's a lot of deception and false teaching going on out there. And I'm not talking about in the world necessarily. I'm talking about in Christian circles. And it's wrapped around enough truth to make it desirable. That piece of fruit was made desirable to Eve because it was wrapped around enough truth. But the lie was right in the middle of it. We must be ever vigilant in protecting God's word from the wolves in sheep's clothing. The application of 2 Timothy 3.16 that I read earlier is still pertinent. There are still calls going out in some circles of Christendom that want to take away the authority of the Bible. They're calling, and again, this has been going on for years, they're calling for a new reformation. The new apostolic reformation, remember that terminology, because that's probably what you'll hear over and above all the others, although it certainly incorporates many lesser groups. But the new apostolic reformation is what we would call a big tent group of Christians or folks who would call themselves Christian, but they are ecumenical in nature. They're compromising with people from other faiths under the banner of Christian activism. Everybody wants to save the world today. Why shouldn't the church? Well, the church isn't called to save the world. The church is called to bring sinners unto repentance. Don't let the word reformation in their title fool you. Their leaders say Christians must reinvent themselves. Another scary word. But we need to do that now that we're in the 21st century in order to survive. And there's a lot of things coming, believe me. Um, that will become clearer and clearer as time goes on. Um, so be careful uh, when we're told that it takes a reinvention of who we are as Christians to survive in this world today. And if you think it's just a passing fancy, think again. They are led by some of the biggest names in religion right now. And they have the attention of political and religious leaders around the world, not just here in America. And the reason they do, the reason they can attract so much attention and good press is because they're willing to compromise biblical Christianity in the name of religious ecumenism. This is what has to happen for the one world order and the one world religion to go marching into the tribulation together. Ecumenism will rule religion in that day. Their claim is because we live in a whole new world, we need a whole new Christianity. They tell us we need to change or we may die. Well, when faced with that option, what did Jesus' disciples do? In fact, what did all of the saints who have ever been martyred for Christ do? What would you do? That's the question we may need to answer one day. They say the church needs to be reformed again. They say we're not to take the Bible literally. We need to change our Attitudes, they tell us, regarding other religions and the nation of Israel. All of these traditional views need to be redefined, they're telling us. So there's a call for a spirit of reconciliation with the Catholic Church, who Bible-believing Christians left 500 years ago. They want social injustice to end. They want to lead the charge for climate change. So again, do you see where all of this is going? 
And it's becoming clearer and clearer with each passing year. The spirit of Antichrist is not only in the air, it's in the church. There are evil movements afoot. And so we must be careful. We must be vigilant. And we must defend the faith at all costs. Let me end with a quote from my good friend John McKnight up at Reformation Bible Church in, in the woods up there in northern Harford County. Darlington, I believe, isn't it? Or Dublin, Darlington? He gives us the real reason why we celebrate the Reformation. He says we do so to commemorate the soul's liberty. It's a proclamation that all who come by faith alone to Christ alone will be delivered from damnation. It's an expression of praise to God who graciously intervened in human history during the Protestant Reformation. He overthrew the tyranny of a corrupted, errant church and brought truth to light once again. And this is important. Rome has never recanted its error. They've never taken that back. They've never abandoned their zeal to be the only church. For love of Christ, truth, and freedom, John McKnight says, Protestants must expose and decry any doctrines, practice, or attitude that would contradict Scripture's precious salvation formula. We must not forget the truth of our heritage. The Protestant Reformation should be celebrated with gratitude to Jesus Christ, who builds and defends his church. And I'll just add that we need to pray that that spirit never leaves us as we live the rest of our lives, not knowing what tomorrow may bring, but trusting with all of our hearts in the one who will bring it. Father in heaven, we do trust you and you alone. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do in and through us. We thank you for this day. Tomorrow's not promised to any of us. Use us this day, dear Lord, to spread the gospel message, to reach the lost. Use us this day, dear Lord, to examine the truths in your holy scriptures. We thank you, Father, that we have the word. We are thankful we have it in our language where we can read it. We thank you, Lord, that we have as many Bibles as we need. There are Bibles in Christian homes that are never open simply because you can't read them all at once. We need to share these Bibles. We need to get the word out to others. There are many in lands around the world who are still being oppressed, who don't have the scriptures. There have been reports of places where single pages of the Bible have been torn out and stuck in people's pockets, and that's all they have. But Lord, that's all they need is your word speaking to them and you leading them unto salvation through it. So we thank you, Father, for what was accomplished 500 years ago. We thank you, Lord, that there are many who are awake enough today to know that it needs to continue to be pursued. The truth, and only the truth, which sets us free, free from the tortures of hell, and on our way to the bliss that is heaven above. So, Lord, be with us. Again, we thank you. Thank you for this church. We thank you for all who are here today, Lord. Thank you for all who are watching by way of the Internet as well. Father, thank you for all the many blessings that you send our way. We are indeed a blessed people. Keep us safe. We know you're by our side every minute of every day, never leaving nor forsaking us. Keep us safe in all that we do. Give us courage and boldness, again, to stand for Christ and him alone. I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.